You're listening to Maritime Gardening Podcast, episode 127, brought to you by Vessi Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. Well, folks, we got Janet Music here today from Dalhousie University, fresh off the uh, the newest edition of Canada's Food Price Report, here to talk to us about food prices. Who's Janet Music? Uh, Janet is a research programmer for the Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University. Um, she's been involved in five editions of the report. She's a PhD student at Dalhousie University right here in Nova Scotia uh, in social anthropology. Uh, her research involves ex- assessing the community impact of small scale food processing. Janet, introduce yourself to my audience and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into this role at Dalhousie? Well, you know, it's interesting, right? Uh, everything is about relationships. And so, you know, I work with Dr. Sylvain Charlebois and, you know, he had an office down the hall from me and we ended up, you know, passing in the hall and chatting. And, you know, it turns out that we have common research interests. And so we began researching in 2018 and uh, interdisciplinary food studies, which, uh, you know, is vast, lots of different topics. And, you know, we ended up working together and, and it's been a pretty fruitful, uh, you know, pun intended uh, relationship uh, since then. So the food price report, though, is uh, has a legacy that predates Dalhousie. And so it started at Guelph uh, oh. University. Yeah, the University of Guelph. Uh, this is the 13th, I believe, edition, uh, either that or we're starting the 13th edition this December, we'll be releasing it. And uh, so it's been tracking food prices in Canada. There was nothing like that beforehand. And and we've really become kind of the voice of, of food price forecasting in Canada. That's great. And I mean, why does Dell produce a report every year? Like, why did they take up the, the mantle in, in spearheading the thing? Well, you know... Why is, why is there a food price report? Right. So, I mean, food is interesting. You can't not buy it, right? You can grow it to a degree. And I think you and I will talk about that a bit more as we get into this topic. But everybody is impacted by food prices, regardless of your income. So if you've got the lowest income or you've got the highest income you are buying food. And so, of course, the lower your income, the more impact that's going to have on your discretionary funding. But as a public institution, uh, universities, Dalhousie, of course, but all universities that are public institutions really have a duty to share research with the public that impacts them in a real way. And, you know, we really see it as our job to inform people and, and, you know, inform policy and, and, you know, Sylvan is actually this week talking to the House of Commons committee on, uh, I believe it's agriculture's subcommittee on food prices. And so, you know, it really is uh, normally not in a, a political, you know, election topic or a political topic of any kind. People Politicians tend not to talk about food, but this work is really driving home the political aspect because, you know, Canadians eat food. And so that's really why we are involved with this report. Right. Yes. And I I remember during the uh, during the pandemic, so many businesses suffered. But I mean, I don't think the grocery stores lost a step. Um, If if, if anything, you know, sales might have been up because people were eating out less and they were cooking more and and just around the house more, so maybe eating more. <laughs> so. That's right. You're you're right. And actually, there was a you know, StatsCan does kind of uh, monitor the ratio of food service versus retail. And you know, pre-pandemic, it wasn't fifty fifty by any stretch of the imagination. People do buy more food at retail than they do at restaurants. But during the pandemic. It was so lopsided, over 90% of food was being purchased at retail. Right. And so restaurants absolutely did suffer and many of them closed. And of course, they're still suffering, right? Because they're they're having a hard time staffing some of those positions and irregular hours make it difficult to keep regular customers. And so you're still seeing this kind of unequal balance of people purchasing their food at retail because, it, you know... It, 
I don't know, maybe there's still some residual fear of, of the virus. I, I think we're mostly over that. It's hard to say. It really is hard to say. It depends on, you know, if you're a big social media user, I guess, and, and the social circles you keep. But absolutely, there has been this kind of retail dominance of the food market here in Canada since 2020. I, I like to think people relearn to enjoy cooking for themselves. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's some days it's hard to have any faith in humanity, but <laughs> I like to think people rediscovered like, geez, you know, I don't mind cutting things up and, you know, frying them and doing, you know, this sort of the food preparation and all this. I like to think that's what happened. Um, you know, um, maybe people, that's what, you know, like I know a lot of people were negatively uh, affected uh, income wise as, and still are. I mean, a lot of people are still really feeling the pain of this thing. So it may be that that's what they can afford and they can't eat out as much. But also, a lot of places to eat out before don't exist anymore. You know, like I, I noticed, I mean, I, I work in a high rise in a mall um, and uh, oh, a lot of places closed. And mm -hmm. I mean, some of the mom and pops, I mean, literally, where it's like a husband and wife and they're the only people there. Some of them, but even some of those didn't survive. There's like a fish and chip place that I love to go and they're gone. They didn't make it. It was just two people. They didn't have any staff and they were there every day of the week. You know what I mean? And they're gone. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to I, know. You know, those stories are so hard to hear, right? And it's not just not just our small, tiny corner of Canada. I mean, that happened all across the country. And yeah. and you're right, people did start cooking more uh, during lockdowns. They really had no choice. And, you know, it's it's sad. You want to have a mixture of, of economic development and, and support for community entrepreneurship. But at the same time, you it shouldn't take a global pandemic for people to get reacquainted with their kitchens. <laughs> no. So, you know, it's a fine line, right? It's a fine line. Yeah, yeah. So in uh, in broad strokes, how about you? You, What does the what is the report telling us about food prices for the for the coming year? So it's a forecast. You're right. Yes, it does forecast. kind of predict using past data. It predicts, uh, you know, future prices. And it's interesting that we're talking at this time because, you know, last week I set all the meetings for the report for 2023. So that report will be released uh, in December, December 7th. And so okay. so really what we're talking about is the report for 2022, which That's we're fine. kind of still in the middle of. Yes. And, you know... <laughs> I remember we had this meeting last October, or maybe early November, and, you know, as a group, and there's four universities involved. So Guelph, like I mentioned, is still involved, and then UBC and U Saskatchewan. And so, you know, it's a virtual meeting, and there's 30 people on the call, and and we're talking about, you know, we're, we're predicting prices are going to go up by 7%, and we're thinking, that is an outlandish number. That's an outlandish number. And people are not, you know, we don't want to panic anyone. That's not our job. And then it turns out that we are underestimating by a long shot the price of food inflation uh, because it's been up around 10% since June. So that's really not a secret to anyone who's been at the grocery counter. Of course, it depends on what you're buying. Um, but, you know, it's you know, I get a lot of questions about whether or not it's going to come down. And, and, uh, you know, I, I'm hope I'm wrong, but I, I really don't think so. And so, you know, that 7% was, was conservative. And so I see. It's hard, yeah, it's hard to say what next year will bring. Uh, but, you know, in the short term, I don't think people can expect much cheaper prices at the grocery store. Okay, so let's just talk about what the report predicted to for for 2022 because those were your estimates and 2022 still rolling out and now you could no you can't speak to the 2022 actuals because 22 is still not over yet um, right. um so although you you kind of let the cat out of the bag there with your 10 versus 7 percent uh <laughs> but uh okay, so i guess people could I mean, uh, but that's not for every food item and it, there's all this sort of stuff so so let's break this down for us a little bit i know you can't yet speak to the 2023 estimates but for 2022 um what was estimated in terms of uh food price changes by item because you you break this out by by multiple items uh you know milk and or dairy and meat and vegetables and stuff like that so how did that all break it 
That's right. So there is some broad food categories that aren't defined by us, actually. They're defined by the data that we use. And we use um, uh, multiple data sources uh, from both Canada and the U.S., actually, because uh, you know, we're their biggest trading partner or they're our biggest trading partner, excuse me, I should say. And so <laughs> they really define the categories. And so, of course, there's dairy, like you mentioned, there's meat, fruits, seafood, vegetables, uh, bakery, restaurants, which we just talked about, and other. And so across all the categories, there was an increase. And, and some years, that's not the case. Some years, there is there is a modest decrease, but not this year. And, uh, you know, the, the category that was most impacted that we predicted back in, in 2021 was uh, fruits and vegetables uh, or vegetables, I guess, restaurants, of course, which we just talked about some of the problems they're facing and uh, bakery. Um, but, you know, on average, everything is up across the board, uh, five to seven percent. And, you know, we're going to hit that ballpark um, for individual items, I guess. Um, but overall, there are some kind of these large global uh, phenomenon that are driving food prices that actually have nothing to do with with Canadians. You know, it, it, these are global issues. And so, in fact, Canada doesn't even have the highest uh, rate of food price inflation, right? There are other Western countries with higher rates of inflation than us. Right. Uh, though that is little solace, I imagine, for people who are buying food, uh, all of right. us, you know, it doesn't really matter what's happening in the States or in Britain. Uh, but that's to say that there really isn't uh, a, a local answer or a national answer to this problem, since it's a it's it is a global problem. And so, right. yeah, I, I've seen I've, I've actually just thinking of a, I took a history course 100 years ago. Um, at St. Mary's University, and I was just remembering this uh, photograph in this book, and uh, it's an inflation book, and it's <laughs> it's got a picture of a kohlrabi, which is a really obscure kind of turnip, cabbage type thing from 1923. It cost 50 million marks. Ooh. <laughs> that was a bad week if you're a big fan of kohlrabi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh just to give uh viewers context that uh you know things can get uh crazy although i don't think that's where necessarily where we're going because uh you know these kinds of economic forces were well to put it another way the kind of economic system we have now was very much a social experiment uh 100 years ago um it's still uh it's still a social experiment ex social experiment in terms of like history of civilization, 4,000 years, or however you want to, <laughs> that depends yeah. on how you want to count, right? How far you want to go back. But uh, yeah, like, you know, you know, democratic, uh, you know, free market capitalism, that sort of thing. It's still relatively new. Um, so um, anyway, um, getting off topic here. <laughs> so, I mean, we can talk about that all day if you like, because, you know, <laughs> I guess I get a lot of questions about, you know, the big retailers in the country and there are five big retailers here and three of them I would say Metro, Loblaws and Empire Sobeys are Canadian the other two are Walmart and Costco so they're they're international yes. and you know I get asked if people if they are actually artificially inflating their prices and hiding it under the national inflation rate and you know there's really no evidence of that um, right. if you're looking at their their financial statements and, you know, I think that really goes to show if you look at what's happening in Germany and you mentioned marks now, nothing is going to go up to 50 million marks at this point. <laughs> like, I, I would I would almost guarantee it, uh, maybe not 100 percent, but almost. But their food price inflation is at 16 percent. So, yeah, it's high. And so do I think that, you know, retailers are inflating their prices artificially? In some respects, it doesn't matter because it's legal for them to raise their prices because we live in a capitalist uh, food economy. And so yeah. this is the conversation instead of food prices and are they artificially raising their prices and what's happening here? Maybe the conversation it should be who should control our food supply and who gets to make money from it and how much money 
do we tolerate as a society from yes. private companies uh, making money off our 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 basic right to life? I know, like the I mean, the prevailing system is that it's whatever the market bears, whatever you know, like so. Uh, superstore sets uh, sells their bread for three dollars a price and uh, three dollars a loaf, and Sobeys sells their bread for two fifty a loaf. Everybody goes to Sobeys, so the superstore right. lowers their price for one type of bread to uh, you know two forty five, you know <laughs> that sort of thing, right? It's, it's all supposed to work out and that sort of thing, but uh, it doesn't always work out that way sometimes. And, and of course, we do have a degree of you know, governmental control over certain things that are considered essential and a degree of tax relief on certain kinds, you know, like luxury food is taxed and essential food. And, and these definitions are all arbitrary and constantly changing. <laughs> some food's taxed and some food isn't taxed and that sort of stuff. Um, but uh, I don't want to bore my uh, viewers <laughs> with uh, politics. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, um, to speak to, there's one thing I really like about your report where every year, you you review the previous year's projections. So, like right now, you're you're gonna you're gonna release a report really soon where you you make an estimate of what, what's going to happen in 2023. Um, but 2022 is going to end. That's so, right. in that same report, you're going to show uh, the distance between your 2022 estimates and your 2023 actuals. Um, so, you know, how accurate were your 2022 estimates uh, well, i don't know if you can tell me that i guess yeah, yeah I, I can't tell you that i can't tell you that quite yet let's I talk really about the 2021 then yeah. yeah at the end of the year and i i predict we will be under um but in 2021 we actually uh, predicted that prices would be up about a thousand bucks so nine nine hundred and sixty six dollars and that people would pay an average family of four with a teenage uh, boy and a and a, a preteen uh, daughter would probably pay just under fifteen thousand dollars, and so right. uh, you know we're very close um, yes. to that, right? And and it, it is it is quite accurate, and uh, I think that it won't be accurate for this coming year, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we put it in there for for precisely the reason because you know that we want to be accountable and we want people yeah. to understand you know what we're trying to do here and and you know it's information that people can take you know with them I think to be you said not to bore people with their politics but I actually think that this is very political and and yes. to take this kind of information and say it's becoming uh untenable or unaffordable to have uh two children in this country because look how much it is to feed them well and if so, you're making minimum wage and the rate and your wage doesn't go up seven percent and food goes right. up seven percent and your rent goes up seven percent what are you supposed to do you know you can economize you can you can get a deal you can maybe eat less you can i don't know start gathering berries on the side of the road there's all kinds of things you can do but there's a limit to what you can do right and <laughs> There is, and and what is it that that those what efficiencies are acceptable? And we just actually did a, a just you know sometimes we do these kind of short surveys with a with a partner, a marketing research firm that we partner with, just to kind of take the temperature of of consumers, Canadian consumers, not for academic purposes, but you know just to keep that kind of community engagement in our work. Yeah. And we did ask people, you know, we didn't say you know what what efficiencies are you trying to achieve, but we said you know. <laughs> how are you dealing with inflation in your household? And, and, you know, 23% said they're, they're not buying certain items because they're unaffordable, but more alarming, 7% of people said they're skipping meals because they can't afford to buy food. So is that efficient? I, I don't know. I don't, yeah. I don't know. I would be, if I was in that situation and that was an answer that came to me from my elected official, I, I would, I would be ticked off. I would yes. be. Well, especially when you, I mean, I mean, I remember when I was in my early twenties and I was living on my own and you know, I was a full-time student and a part-time employee. And I was, you know, I, I was living below the poverty line for a single individual. And uh, you know, I had to make extraordinarily rationally choice, rational choices about 
caloric intake. <laughs> Let's put it that mm -hmm. way. <laughs> All right. But that was, it was a very temporary part of my life and, and the impact was on me. I didn't That's have right. children. I didn't have dependents. I didn't have a, a, an aging mother who lives with me or whatever, anything like that. Right. So, um, and it was temporary. Right. Uh, I had anticipated, I had some great plan to, to make it, you know, that sort of thing. Right. But it was temporary, you know, cause I was a full-time student. It's hard to make money when you're sitting in a classroom all day and writing assignments and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I really, uh, I'm not quite sure how people are supposed to deal with, um, these price changes. Also, when you expect that it, it's not like it's, it's going to go negative 7% next year. And they, you know, you know, like, cause I, I looked like I quickly did a perusal of your reports going back as many years as I could find them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it, it's going like this and it seems to be not in step with inflation. It's the, the, the food price increases seem to be, uh, I mean, it depends on what, what, pit, what section of time you pick and how wide you make the thing. But you know, yeah. and, and what, what I did was hardly uh, scientific, but it seems like prices are going up and uh, it's it's a squeeze, right? Especially for anyone just trying to get by. That's uh, right. And it, it's 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 a band, right? So we'll never be able to say meat is going to go up 2.6% in this year. You know, we have a <clears throat> we have a band, an upper and a lower limit. And in it, it's interesting. It does. You know, it depends on what expert you ask. Is is the general inflation rate driving food price inflation, or is it vice versa? And, and food is such a complicated uh, item in, in in our lives, right? Because it's not just an apple. Like when you look at an apple, you're looking at man hours and inputs and 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 fertilizer and you know climate change and you know a lot is represented in in one item of food and and yeah. I, you know apples are rarely controversial but if you think about something like uh, meat right meat is quite controversial and and so then you have uh, and expensive. And so we think of, you know, when you're going into the supermarket, you know that meat is probably going to be one of the more expensive items in the basket. But when you're looking at that cut of meat, what you're looking at is so much more than your supper. It's actually, you know, farmers and transportation and and taxes and, and political fighting amongst stakeholders. And it's a lot. It's a lot of... Um, uh, it's it's a lot of heavy. <laughs> well, I often think heavy. like if you if you look at them, you could choose meat or you could even choose uh, lettuce in a bag, right? You you work back just in terms of oil, right? I mean, you you've got the oil that was used to make the bag, the oil that was used to run the factory that makes the bag, you got the oil that was used to 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 or or the we put it another way the energy cost right because oil is just a metaphor for energy the energy cost to keeping the the lettuce cold in the store and running everything that that you know keeps the lettuce looking fresh in the store and then you've got the energy cost of getting the lettuce from wherever it was grown to the store and also the energy cost of uh, keeping it fresh in the thing it was used to get from the place it was grown to the store mm -hmm. and the energy cost of whatever machines they used to to you know work the farm and all that sort of stuff at the store and <laughs> there's just energy 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 so I mean, when you're buying a lettuce and you pay three dollars and fifty cents for a head of romaine lettuce to make a caesar salad I, you're i don't know how much of that cost is oil and or you know various forms of energy costs but it's got to be a huge portion when you consider like i did a podcast once where i talked about i, I looked at gardening as an investment where I was saying like, you can buy $2 worth of seeds and grow $40. I was talking about something like kale, right? So you can yeah. put two bucks worth of seeds and you, and you have $50 worth of produce. There's no investment in the world that works out that way, right? But that's directly in your backyard where you pay 20 bucks for the seeds and then the sun does everything else. You know, uh, the water, water falls out of the sky and the, the sun energy is actually what's being absorbed by the plant. When you're eating the plant, you're kind of eating the sun energy that was stored up in the plant. So it's, it's an incredibly tight investment circle um, by comparison. When you buy the lettuce at the store, you're, you're paying for 
oil to get the lettuce from Mexico or California or someplace yeah. like that to Halifax, right? It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, I think looking at food from an environmental bottom line that way, uh, you know, it, it is fair, I think, especially now, you know, when we're being impacted by very strange adverse weather weather patterns. And I think it's fair to start calculating not just the financial cost of food and you know you talk about people as if they're going to eat that lettuce in fact they're going to put it in the back of their fridge and let it wilt and then they're going to throw it out because you know they ate hamburgers and you know I, you know yeah. we shop yeah. aspirationally and we waste a ton of food about oh, 60 percent of food in this country could be eaten and so we you know we're talking about financial costs right now because we we see that impact on households what we can't quantify in the same way is the financial cost i mean the environmental costs on households because it's not a direct line between i threw out that lettuce and hurricane fiona just knocked down the tree in front of my house they're connected, but you know it's a it's a very long calculation to get from A to B, right? But yes. they're related in some way. I was just thinking today. I was watch, I was just looking at something. I don't don't try to. I try not to spend a lot of time on Facebook, um, but as a you know social media guy, I kind of have to be on there a little bit. And uh, so I saw someone posting all the all the apples that were going to be lost for those that don't know that are listening uh both janet and i live in a province that sort of prizes itself on its apples right and there's a mm -hmm. part of the province where apples grow really well and they're really tasty and they develop their own strains of apples and i've got apples in my garden that were li literally developed by sinus uh science sciences uh scientists uh in that area in kentville um in ag what's it called agricultural research lab mm -hmm. um but they were showing this whole orchard of apples and how it's all going to be lost. And someone asked, well, why don't they just pick them? Right. And, you know, people were arguing and arguing and arguing on Facebook, you know, such a dumpster fire. But I mean, what, <laughs> no, like, you know, what people were, the, the sort of people that understand these sorts of things we're trying to explain is if they, picking them costs money. And if they pick a bunch of apples that aren't ripe because they're three weeks not ready, they're three weeks away from being ready, no one will buy them. They can't even use them as like, you know, the, the apple equivalent of dog food, right? They can't use them. They won't even make apple juice from them because they're not ripe, right? So there's there's no point in picking them all because they're, right now, they're not worth anything. In three weeks, they're worth something. Right now, they're not worth a thing, right? And it's so much of agriculture is tenuous like that, where the mm -hmm. timing is everything. It's two weeks to really no good, right? Timing, perfect. And, and some things can can ripen, you can pick them unripe and apply something like ethylene gas, like with bananas and ripen mm -hmm. them, you know, or to tomatoes, I guess. There's things you can pick if, you know, like for those that, I think I'm gonna do a podcast with another gardener in a future date. We're gonna talk about all the different things you can pick when they're unripe and have them ripen later on. And some like tomatoes are a good example. As long as there's a hint of color on the tomato, you can pick that. Mm -hmm. And uh, blind taste tests have shown that it tastes just as good uh, ripened in a brown paper bag on your counter as it did with a sun ripened uh, basically the sun ripened notion with the tomato is a myth uh, but there's so many things where that doesn't work out right you have to especially a lot of these tree fruits um, yeah. they have to be done so i mean these you have an entire crop of uh you know apples wiped out uh, and then if you want to buy an apple it's not coming from down the road it's coming from some other place or even if all the apples in the world were wiped out and your apples down the road are the only ones that are available. Well, those are more valuable now because everybody in the world wants them. <laughs> so even though you've got local produce, the guy that's growing those apples can sell them to China or Germany or some other place for way more than locals will pay. And so the price goes up anyway, right? That's right. So it's speaking to that global aspect of food prices where there's things beyond our control. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose if you just made it illegal for the farmer to uh, to sell, <laughs> <laughs> to, to anyone else but that's uh that would be very difficult to do uh in our system <laughs> um uh, yeah i don't know that that would go over very <laughs> no i don't think so i was going to ask you you know for these different i mean you've got these different uh bins right mm -hmm. where you've got bakery dairy fruits meat other 
of course, the infamous other uh, mm -hmm. restaurants, seafood and vegetables. Um, how did you, so when you say vegetables, right? So uh, your your report called for a five to 7% increase in vegetables, is that correct? That's right. For That's 2022, right. yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's different, there's vegetables like a head of cabbage and 50 pound bags of potatoes and turnip. And then there's vegetables like a bag of kale salad with this with the salad dressing in it and the nuts with it, right? And there's vegetables like spinach in a bag, washed and cut up and all ready to go. That's or right. like uh, watermelon that's been sliced for you and placed on a, a styrofoam thing with cellophane over. So it, when you say vegetables, is it just anything that is a vegetable in a store? So when you speaking. describe, yeah, when you describe the salad with the nuts and the and the dressing, that's an other. That's, that's another. actually a prepared food now, prepared right? Even food, though yeah. it, it's vegetables technically, but it, it's not. Uh, it's a value add, right? A value add. So it's unclear. Um, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with everything in the categories because we're talking about thousands and thousands of products. So, you know, that the the baby spinach in the in the clamshell that's all washed and and picked and beautiful. Um, I suspect it's in vegetables, but it may be in other, but these like, you know, sandwiches that you would get at the retail grocery store is not under restaurants that would be under, under other, right? So, right. you know, lobster that you get that's already cooked and he's all red and he's like wrapped up in, in cellophane, that would be under seafood. So it really, again, it's not it's somewhat arbitrary, right? But these things are historical too. Some of those categories go back to 1959. Wow. And so some of those decisions that were made on the categories are, are from people who might not even be living anymore. Right. <laughs> so, you know, we just, we have to work with what, what is out there. And, and so that's why the categories are broad and there's a band, right? So that we're not being you know, too specific, we're within the band, the five to 7%, uh, but we wouldn't be able to tell you. Now I could tell you if I went into StatsCan for the month of, you know, July when they released the numbers and looked at certain products. So, you know, one time this summer, I believe it was the June numbers where the best cut of steak, which is, forgive me, I think it's sirloin or strip loin. I get them confused all the time, right. um, went up 52%. So now, again, if you're precariously employed or if you, you know, you're sandwiched between elderly parents and, and children, or if you're single income, you're probably not buying the best cut of steak. And that's an extreme example. Um, but these, these categories are so broad that they capture a lot of things. So they're an average. There was something, and when I was reading the report, I was thinking of when they're dropping stuff off from a plane to devastated parts of the world, and they're giving these people like porridge and rice, right? Those sorts of really, really critical starch staples that just maintain caloric intake, keep you from starving to death in the short term, right? You could, if you have that, and you have an egg a day, and you have a vitamin pill, you'll be all right sort of thing, right? Yeah. And I was thinking, like it would be great. And I know you're you're hit, you're 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 um, you're constrained to the categories that it that you that the report is historically reported on. But my goodness, it would be fantastic to have an indication on staples. So oh. and, you know, you know what I mean, like potatoes, oatmeal, flour, rice. You know, some handful of things like that, a bin of things like that that you can buy relatively in large quantity, relatively cheaply. They can they can provide for a good you know not necessarily vitamin rich but they can um you know people don't starve to death for lack of vitamins they starve to death for lack of caloric intake you know they, if they don't have vitamins they get sick and die for other reasons other the, terrible well, reasons you know? this is um, the thing right <laughs> you know and, and the government releases the the canada's food guide with these recommendations for leafy greens and colorful vegetables and and, you know, we're talking about, you know, maybe we should look at, you know, granular, like, you know, large bags of macaroni that keep people living. And so you have this like great inequality of, you know, people who can afford to eat according to the food guide yes. and people who are just 
trying to stay alive. And, and it's interesting because there's a very famous kind of uh, academic article about, you know, humanitarian aid and, and people who, you know, have, you know, the way we eat is culturally driven. You know, I, I grew yes. up in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. And so I have cultural foods um, from my heritage that, you know, belong and anchor me in a time and a space. And so imagine, you know, and everybody in the world is like that, right? And so you think, oh, borscht comes from here and sauerkraut comes from here and poutine comes from here. So <laughs> there's always these examples. Now imagine you are hit by, you know, a, a war or some kind of crazy weather event. And the only thing that you have to eat is, is white. So macaroni and an egg. And so you're, yes, it keeps you alive, but it, it's, it, it impoverishes, it impoverishes you um, both in, in vitamins, but also kind of spiritually, yes. right? It, it, yeah. It's, it disconnects you from from your neighbors who can afford to eat and from your heritage and so i think in terms of of why food prices are really important not just because you know we know the impacts it's going to have on households you know it's just creating this kind of financial but also spiritual inequality for people who can't afford to eat the way they should be or the way that they've been taught to I guess. Yes. No, I totally follow that. You know, yeah. Every time we, my, my wife, my wife buys most of the groceries and that, that's not a division of labor thing. I would prefer to do it. Uh, there, there was a period of time where I was only working part-time. I mean, she was working full-time and I bought all the groceries and I loved it because <laughs> I, I like to cook and I, I like to sort of, I remember that, that would have been like 2013, 2014, 2015. And at the time we were trying to have a family budget of $50 a week. Um, yeah. And we, you know, I mean, with the exception of like, you know, special occasions, um, we, we stuck with it, but it was, it was having, you know, dried beans, rice, potatoes, <laughs> but as a portion of pasta, right. A portion of every meal and just being creative with those sorts of things. Um, um, but I mean, it took, I, I was able to figure all of that out because I was working part-time. Right. So I could, I, you know, I wasn't working 12 hours a day, right. Trying to figure all that's this right. stuff out. I was working part, I was actually a part-time professor at SMU. Um, so that's, that is not an eight hour day job, no. <laughs> as you know, in the academic world. <laughs> so, so I could, you know, and I'd, I'd worked in restaurants and stuff like that. So I had, you know, a sort of base culinary skills and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Right. So I could, I could build, I had the background to sort of play with that a little bit. Um, but man, what do other people do? Right. Um, I guess that kind of segues to it. So we, prices are going up. Um, let's just run through some of the key reasons for why prices are going up. Right. You, some of so, that's mentioned in the report. Yeah. I mean, in terms of some of the reasons that they're going up, it's interesting because we're getting to, you know, I think we're in the third quarter, we're getting into the fourth quarter. And when we wrote this report, we didn't have any idea that Russia would, you know, invade Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, we're in Europe, who knew 2022, right? Yes. And so that's not represented in the report, because if we had done that, people would have thought we were nuts. And so, but you know, I can't, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it because it absolutely is impacting global food prices uh, because both Ukraine and Russia uh, supply the commodities market with things like wheat. So 25 to 30% of wheat comes from those two countries and those were offline for a while. Well, you know, energy like, resources. What's that? Energy resources. As oh, well. energy resources, but also fertilizer. So fertilizer. In, inputs for fertilizers which you know a lot of people don't think about uh you know those things that you know, the food that our food needs and not just the stuff that cattle eat like you know grains but also plants need food as well and so you know they went offline for a while i think it's still intermittent and and so that drives prices up so that's not represented in the report at all because mm -hmm. you know we didn't know that right but things like covid-19 had you know 
the so-called great resignation where people were shifting around in their jobs uh you know they you know the shipping industry for whatever reason COVID-19 I think being one of the main ones was you know suffered uh, lots of, of of job they were unable to fill so interestingly and then you end up with the like cold chains and that's you know fruits and vegetables which we get from California and and South America and Central America well you know there's no one to pick them up from the dock so they're like stuck on the dock rotting and so you know that of course raises prices as well and and there were a number of border kind of uh bottlenecks i guess yes. you would call them because you know we were still distrustful right remember the vaccine didn't really come online until when i don't know summer of 2021 was it I, yes I can't, I can't remember uh so it all blends, <laughs> know, it's all funny, it's all blends together and so this of course all works together to raise prices and then you know the big x factor and 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 we were just hit by a hurricane uh is climate change and so you know you're a gardener i don't have to explain to you how climate impacts what it is you are able to grow but in terms of uh you know in the last couple of years uh droughts out west have required farmers to shrink their herds because it's expensive to keep them cool and to water them Crops aren't growing in the way they should because of the excessive heat. Again, water becomes an issue. And then, of course, you know, in the fall of last year, I believe, you have devastating floods. So you have parts of the country that are on fire because of, you know, exceptionally dry conditions out of control wildfires and droughts. And then you have other parts that are, are flooding to the point where they're cut off completely from the rest of the country. So it's these things, uh, you know, devastate kind of the flow of the supply chain. And, and, and it's interesting for, for, for people to kind of conceptualize the supply chain. You know, I think we just talked about lettuce, actually. You described the, the supply chain, right. basically, right? But you didn't get to the point before the lettuce actually grows, you know, the cost of the land and the fertilizer and, and the equipment investment and all of these things. So the supply chain isn't actually a, a chain. It's more of a loop. And so when you get issues within that loop, then things go haywire. And then once one domino, you have a domino effect in some cases. And, and COVID-19 was just, again, uh, really unpredictable for a lot of people. You know, in, you know, when it was the fall of 2019, didn't think that there would be a global pandemic, right? And so these things kind of play out for a couple of years. Will that impact prices going into next year? I think there'll still be some residuals but we're doing really well with vaccine saturation. Uh, you know, people have gotten the vaccine. People are continue to get their boosters. And, you know, I think people, it becomes endemic, right? Not a pandemic, yes. it becomes endemic. And so then the supply chain isn't as disrupted. And remember back in 2020, people were fearful of supply chain collapse. There was panic buying and hoarding going on. In, oh, in the toilet paper. Yeah, <laughs> in, the, in the spring, right? And yeah, so, yeah. but, you know, the supply chain proved to be robust. And and yes, there were shortages and occasionally there were empty shelves. You know, we couldn't get cereal that we liked for a number of months. But, you know, we get a lot of variety here. So you, you kind of make do. Um, yeah. So you didn't have that specific brand. But yeah. so these are some of the reasons. Now, going into 2023, like we've had, we've recently had a pandemic. There's a war in Europe. I I'm not sure what else. And I, you know, knock on wood, I hope there is nothing else. And that yes. these lingering problems will kind of, you know, there should be a solution. The war in Ukraine has lasted way longer uh, than anyone anticipated that it would. Um, yes. um, and I, you know, it, we shouldn't go into the details of that, but you know, presumably it's going to come to an end, it has to, and hopefully without devastating consequences of the nuclear type. Yeah. But, you know, these these things will will wrap themselves up. Um, but you're right, you, you know, you mentioned earlier that prices won't be negative 7% next year. And you're right, food prices likely won't correct to pre-pandemic levels. 
I don't think, but we might see a slowing of the inflation. So instead oh, yeah. of instead of quickly reaching 10%, it could be that they only go up to 2, 2%, 2 2.5%, which is be a nice, normal. Yeah, that would be a nice respite from all of this. Absolutely. One concern I carry in my mind is the, the incredible edifice that our entire uh, not, I mean, our economy, but also just the food chain is, is the reliance on, you know, um, the fossil fuel energy. And this is a finite resource that, you know, the demand for it increases every year globally, and there's only so much of it. And so you know, my, my concern is that if we, and I mean, as a species, can't find, um, I mean, there's two solutions. I was just talking to a friend of mine who's uh, actually a sociologist who studies this sort of thing. I mean, either there's some fundamental change in our energy usage that decreases it, which is a very hard sell because everybody wants their stuff the way the stuff is. Yes. Um, or we have a new way of producing energy, like some of these nuclear options or solar or what have you, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, rich energy sources that displaces and changes and change it changes things over from fossil fuels. Um, like I just don't see food prices going down as long as everything relies on digging something out of the ground, doing a bunch of stuff to it, and putting it into a smoke machine that makes makes it go sort of thing. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean... and, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, all the reserves are known. There's there's no new discovery, right? We're not going to go somewhere and find tons and tons of oil or anything. Everything's known sort of thing. Um, and, and we've become very efficient with how we use it. And we've even figured out how, how to use oils like the tyrosins out in Alberta that were kind of useless, uh, mm -hmm. ex, you know, maybe a, a half a century ago. But now we can make use of that stuff. Um, but there's a limit to all of this stuff, and it's being used up at an incredible rate. Uh, so... As, as long as that's the edifice that our, our economies and our, f our food supply chain is built on, I'm I'm very concerned for where it's all going until we change um, change the energy source. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> sorry, I threw this at you. I just I was just thinking. Just you were like, <laughs> I never wanted to be my job to panic anyone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean I don't even know if I want to comment on that because I'm a bit okay. nihilist, you know what I mean? Like, there's eight billion people in November, eight billion people on this planet. Yeah. And I, I it, it's not sustainable. So, you know, I was saying to my husband, because we just experienced that hurricane and we were out of power for two days, and I said, Oh, it's gonna be a big adjustment for me when society finally collapses because I've got one, two, three, four lights and a laptop and a cell phone all going here and my printer's plugged in yes. like in one room. Yeah. So it, yeah, I mean, I, I can't really, I mean, the whole supply chain is predicated on fossil fuels is, I don't like it's to like think. There's, of there's parts of the world where they have, I mean, there's parts of the world where they have rolling brownouts, right? Because that's just, we can't we can't supply the whole grid so you're not going to have power from two o'clock to three o'clock and they're not right and that's how they work it all out we don't do that here but there's parts of the world but that's just how things run um uh yeah. so i mean that's another solution uh but think about how angry people would get i mean i was quite impressed generally speaking i was generally impressed with the whatever you want to call it the stoicism or the the, the general attitude of Canadians throughout the pandemic was, okay, this isn't great, but, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, and, then, of course, there were some people that were just completely economically displaced by the event, so they have yeah. a right to be angry. Absolutely. Um, and then there's other people who were just angry because they couldn't, you know, go to the hockey games and stuff like that, you know. But th that third category, I didn't see a lot of, you know, there. I don't think that was a critical mass. I think for the most part, people understood. And so I was very impressed with that, that stoicism and that patience and, you know, some degree of uh, faith that the government was making uh, decisions that were sort of good for the whole. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, but let's say government have... takes away your power from 8 o'clock, 8 a.m. To, to 11 p.m. every Sunday. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> How I would people think... handle that? <laughs> 
you know, take the power away from two o'clock to four o'clock every afternoon and I won't work those hours. You just keep paying me. I will siesta. And, hey, uh, sign me up for that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe people will be okay with, okay, we're in a nap. Like it's the national nap hour. Siesta. Yeah, so everything is shutting down. And in the, in, in the early days of the lockdown, there was a bit of that where people are like, oh, I can, I can actually nap in the middle of the day or uh, you know oh this is what my husband looks like I, I haven't seen that guy in like five years you know what I mean yes. or, yeah. <laughs> lots of people started gardening right yes. you know oh, yeah a lot yeah. of people right yeah. so we think about eight percent of the country tried to grow at least a tomato plant <laughs> that's huge and, yeah, I, and some people stuck with it. And some people like myself were like, I'm never going to accomplish this. But <laughs> I mean, it opened up people's kind of eyes to food in a way that they had been just ignoring because no one had the time. Like food was, imagine the thing that keeps you alive. And, and for hundreds and thousands of years, the thing that kept Homo sapiens and, 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 our, and our ancestors you know, occupied from sun up to sundown, acquiring food has become an afterthought yeah. and an inconvenience because yeah. of everything else. And like, I, I once, you know, Sylvain Charlebois, I mentioned him earlier, he's a food professor and he knows, he knows a lot about food and distribution. And he, he took me when we were first working together to a grocery store and, and we were kind of talking about all the different fruits and I had never paid attention to what the fruit and vegetable aisles look like they right. are colorful and beautiful and you pick what you want according to your taste like is it too hard is it too soft imagine our ancestors not not our recent ancestors but even the middle ages being able to do such a thing in in a climate controlled environment at yes. in the middle of the night 1 a.m or yes. or even you know even when people were living in round houses i don't you know maybe the stone age oh it's almost offensive it's almost you... offensive that we have become so disconnected from our food supply and we just take it for granted and i think the pandemic opened our eyes to it a little bit because we we're like whoa you know if this thing goes south I have no idea how I'm going to feed myself. We're going to be all the way down to turnips and cabbages real quick. That's uh, right. <laughs> and then, you know, and that's the thing about prices as well, right? It, it, it forces you to recognize, you know, people think that, you know, that steak should be a lot cheaper than it actually is. But, you know, as you mentioned, all that energy and, and think of all the hands that have touched it, you know, all of those people needed to get paid. A $3 head of lettuce is pretty cheap right you know yeah. and and you know in ontario they talk about the eight dollar cabbage uh no cauliflower pardon me eight dollar cauliflower that sounds yeah. Right. yeah and and i think to myself wow like <laughs> i mean yes it's it's hard to afford for people who who were precariously employed and and all of those other things but but we only pay attention to it when it and when we're worried about it or scared about it or we don't want to pay for it i remember mm -hmm. when meat prices started going up and and, and you're and you're in, at least in the 2022 report you you predicted very very little it was just a small increase in meat prices and fish prices that's right um, but i mean they've gone up a lot in in recent years compared to what i remember you know when we bought this house 2011 and because the number rings in, in my head um you could buy prime rib which is like one of the finest, you know, it's the most, ex one of the most, filet mignon, as, as, as I think of, is one of the most expensive meats you can buy. But prime rib is way up there, right? Um, you got to kill an entire cow to get about this much of it, yeah. right? Not a yeah. lot on a whole cow, right? Something the size of a car and you get about this much and a basketball's worth of it right? out of a cow, right? Um, so uh, the prime rib was $11 a kilogram. And I remember saying to my, my wife, how are they making money? at this price i mean I, I grew up in the 1970s and i remember meat being expensive right like we didn't have if we had steak it's because my dad killed something that was made of steak yes. <laughs> like a deer right 
you know, or a relative gave us some moose or something like that, right? Like it was very, if we had beef, it would be hamburger. And, you know, if we had uh, meat, we have pork chops or something like that, a special occasion sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so because the meat, the whole factory farming thing wasn't up and running, right? So now when we get pork, it comes from like Quebec, from some massive thing that, that just, you know, spits out pigs at some mm -hmm. incredible rate, right? Um, so you can get this pork for like, you can get, uh, what's that called? Pork tenderloin, which is basically the filet mignon of a pork, of a pig, for $4 a kilogram. I mean, that's insane. Like that's, I know. so the price of that is going up. But what was amazing was that it was that low. Right. It's and you know that's why those categories you know it might be different coming up this year. We haven't done the number crunching obviously yet, but when the category is already expensive, the idea is the market won't bear it being much more expensive than it already is. And you see this on social media. You see people posting pictures of an eighty dollar roast, right? Who in their right mind would buy such a thing, right? And that's the market, that's that's the market like not bearing that price. And so that's why the meat, the meat category only is predicted to go up two percent. But oh, because it's already it's, it's an already, expensive item already. Ah, that's right. It's already inflated, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, yeah. but you know, again, there are things that and and meat comes from Canada, right? So it's we're not importing a ton of meat or on the other meat. side of the planet yes that's right <laughs> yes, where yes. you know vegetables and fruits we are and and uh, the bakery category people are like well you know we make that stuff here but we don't make the oil that goes into oh. bakery is is a lot of you know oils and so we don't make those here either and oils are up 17 percent, right so they're they're actually increasing quite significantly because of the part of the world they come from and so that's why those categories you know you see the different and of course dairy we knew it was going up because they announced it was going to go up they said they were going to increase the price by eight percent and they actually raised it by ten percent so we're low on that as well man that's, that's, that's the only one that didn't affect me because i'm i completely intolerant of dairy I, I haven't had any kind of dairy in my body since 2011 um <laughs> So uh, I've saved a fortune. <laughs> I, I miss yeah. it a lot, but uh, it's, it's actually strange because when you have these like fake ice cream, it actually costs more than real ice cream. Um, and I find that like, how is it the case that coconuts, you know, <laughs> cost more than cow milk? Because we don't, we don't grow coconuts here. <laughs> I guess we don't grow coconuts. Yeah, I guess yes, there's that. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So like we, okay. So we've, we've really done a lot of gloom and doom. So let's let's stir the figure out and sort of move things to like you know how do we get out of this mess or at least how do we mitigate? So are there any food items that are particular? So aside from the categories, but just within the categories, food items that are resistant to price increase and and uh -huh. why are they resistant? Yeah, so not many, obviously, <laughs> but, uh, but you know one of the famous ones and one that people notice the most is bananas. And, and bananas are an interesting commodity. They have a, a rich cultural history, bananas. So, you know, if anyone is watching this and are, who cares about bananas? You, you know, go look at the politics of bananas, you know, in the last hundred years, and you'll see a very violent story um, about bananas. But I think I've seen a documentary on that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, they're, yeah, they're not, they're not this um, kind of benign fruit that we take for granted. They are now, uh, but they weren't. Um, but now they are, and, and they're, they're relatively stable priced. You know, they go up a little bit, but not too much, even though we ship them, right? We don't grow bananas here, but uh they're not, they're grown in places that are not subject to growing seasons. So they're pretty stable, you know, it's hot and, and, and humid all the time. Equatorial so they, sort of thing. Yeah. So when it's hot and humid, bananas are okay. Right. And so, and they take relatively uh, square footage. It's not like you need like big grazing, you know, pastoral lands for bananas. They're quite tightly packed. And the labor is quite cheap and there's economies of scale. So they ship thousands and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of bananas, millions and millions of bananas to Canada. Uh, and, you know, as we mentioned earlier, 
they pick them before they're ripe. They ripen on the counter. So you can control them a little bit, right? So yes. they tend to be quite stable. And, and people, uh, you know, we eat a lot of bananas in this country and they're actually very nutrient packed and, and they're not subject to shrinkflation either. So, you know, we talk about this idea of shrinkflation a lot. Which is, so when you, know, it, it happens to those center of the store aisles a lot, you know, the chips and the cookies and the pasta where the price remains the same. So the price isn't going up the volume shrinks over time. Oh. So you may be able, you know, used to paying X, you know, $5 for a package of 20 cookies. Then over time, the package doesn't shrink, but the cookies get smaller, but there's more cookies in the package. Yeah, so it's the cereal you, box thing where there's a- Yes, yeah, yeah, so you yeah. don't notice. And then over time, less cookies in the package. Yes. So it's kind of sneaky in a way of raising prices, but bananas are huge, right? Yeah. So they are actually not getting smaller. Bananas are, are quite large. And so bananas, I think are, are probably um, an outlier unique in this kind of food price inflation landscape. And, yeah. and I can't really think of anything analogous to that. I think that's it right? When it comes to stability of, of food prices, because right. everything else is subject, you know, even potatoes, you know, there's a growing season for potatoes here. And there was a bit of um, politics around potatoes. Uh, it might have been even, no, it was last fall before winter about PEI potatoes being banned from in, uh, export. So, but bananas well, aren't uh, subject to those things, right? Well, bananas potatoes are, can get different. Uh, I think the uh, the PEI potatoes had a disease. There was, there was a disease, soil disease, right? Which if you, if you, if you start sending those potatoes around, that's the challenge with potato. I grow a lot of potatoes in my garden, but I can only grow a handful of varieties that aren't affected by this thing that my garden potatoes get called potato scab, which it's, it's like a bacteria that lives in my soil. Right. And most potatoes um, are affected by it and it makes a potato look gross. So you could never sell them. But also it greatly compromises the storage time of the potato. Like all the ones that are affected with that, I have to bring, I have to eat them immediately. Um, so I, there's only like a couple of varieties of potatoes I grow that are immune or relatively resistant to it. Um, and those potatoes aren't, I don't like it as much as the other ones. Um, I was also thinking, you're talking about bananas. I wonder if, you know, they could increase the production of other banana like things like you know have you ever had plantain before plantains yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So that's, that's potato really banana. You know, yeah it's like a potato banana i mean my wife yeah. uh, her family's from jamaica and uh you know we we you know we don't have it all the time because it's expensive because generally speaking canadians don't eat it that's um, right but it's delicious right <laughs> if you prepare it, it is properly. delicious <laughs> and you know it's interesting it comes back to that cultural heritage of food it's not something that was, it's probably not in a lot of people's lexicons. Most people don't know what plantains even are, or no. they aren't carried in my local supermarket, the one that I frequent. Uh, you know, in fact, it's weird when there's mangoes there, right? Yes. They carry the staples that most people, bananas, grapes, apples, oranges, yes. not really any exotic fruits. And if you've not been exposed to that, then you you wouldn't know what you know what is this you know and, and if you pick it up and you think it's a banana and you bite into it ooh, you're in for a surprise <laughs> you're not going to be happy <laughs> no there's you know, something wrong with this right I didn't know what any of that was till I till I met my wife and went to her parents' house for dinner <laughs> you know I was like what is this you know it's like these taste you know and then they explain how they prepare them and all that sort of stuff right yeah um, so. They're delicious. I love them, but you know we don't have them very often because we. I don't know where you can even buy them. Probably at the larger supermarket that we would have to leave our community to go to. But, yeah, I can get them. You know, like the, yeah, the the big chains right in town. You can get them, but they're not cheap. Like they're you know like for for the price of one pound of plantain, I can get I don't know five pounds of potatoes, and they're about the same nutritional value. Like they're basically a starch with some potassium and some other yeah. trace, trace stuff in them. Right. So they're, they're both, you know, it just doesn't make sense to, to make a, a regular thing out of plantain because they're just so damn expensive because nobody really buys them. Right. That's right. And again, you know, if you want to get into the environmental impacts, I mean, there are 
huge you know, econo- huge what is it called yeah. ecological footprint associated with that same with bananas but people yeah. don't seem to mind the ecological <laughs> footprint of bananas but you That's know they're right. familiar with bananas right and so That's right. but yeah so bananas i think are are kind of those you know kind of the exception that proves the rule maybe i don't know but i you know i can't think of anything that is is even remotely the same as as a category yeah. I wonder if like coconuts could be, I mean, coconuts again have to be shipped from the warmer places, but they grow on trees. They keep, they're high energy, high fat, you know, like. uh, Yes. Um, I guess I would say about the coconut is that, you know, they're hard to take on the go, right? (laughs) It's not a hand for me. You know, taking, you're going into the office and a meeting and you're peeling a banana and, and showing your slides, you're not like cracking open a coconut while you're, they're a little bit more labor intensive, yes. I guess, to get to the good part. And and shredded coconut, right? The sugary stuff that we use in baking. I mean, that is relatively cheap, I guess, if you consider the environmental cost right. uh, of it. But in terms of raw material, I even coconuts and and you know, I don't know much about coconuts actually. So the ripening factor, I know bananas, you know, they pick them when they're green and they, they keep for a long time. So even if they're sitting on the, on the dock, cause no one was employed to pick them up, they're not going bad right away. I'm not sure what the situation with. Yeah. I don't know. And they don't have to be refrigerated. I don't know that much about coconuts actually. No, I mean, we buy that coconut, the cans of coconut milk, you know, there's always, there's always one brand that's two ninety nine a can. There's another brand that's a dollar a can. Interesting. Uh, we buy the dollar a can coconut milk. Uh, I don't know if it's better quality or whatever, but hmm. um, anyway, I, I guess speaking to that point, um, is there anything people should be doing to deal with it? You know, what strategies can people use to deal with the price increases? I've, I did a, a not a podcast, but I have a column every week. A couple of weeks ago, I wrote. Uh, I wrote down some ideas I had for dealing with that. It, 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 buying in bulk, buying a lot of staples, incorporating them in, in a meal was that, that sort of thing. But, um, you know, yeah. And I don't know what the report speaks to. I think it, well, you can tell us. So what can people do to deal with these price increases? Well, I, you know, the number one thing I think people need to do in this country, and, and I think it will impact both food waste and food prices uh, at the household level, is to make a plan is to right. plan what you're going to eat and stick to your plan and and get used to not being excited by your meals, right? <laughs> you know, we use food as entertainment here a lot. Yeah. And, and if it's not entertainment, it's just an afterthought. And we need to kind of reconceptualize what food is in our lives. And, it, you know, sometimes it's just dinner. Sometimes it's just... Okay, I had this yesterday, but you know what? I'm going to have another meal. We got to use it up. Yeah. You know. And so, if people plan, you know, maybe you planned on lasagna for Wednesday night and you get to Wednesday night and you don't really feel like lasagna, you need to just say, you know what? I bought the stuff for lasagna. I'm going to make it and then I'm going to eat it and I'm not going to throw it away. And I think that will go a long way to kind of people would be surprised you know you stretch those grocery dollars a lot more than you think you would right. and if you plan before you go into the grocery store and you yes. stick to a budget you save a ton of money yes and so that would be number one i think is a behavioral change when it comes to our our thoughts about food and then and then everything else after that is is kind of technique is right. you know looking at flyers and clipping coupons and going to more than one store. That's all just technique, right? How right. you how you perform grocery shopping. But if you change the way you think about it and 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 kind of stick to that, like we need to change our behaviors around food and and maybe we need to not that head of lettuce in a plastic bag, maybe that needs to be not acceptable to us. We you know right. because you know, plastic pollution is terrible. And right. and so we need to, and, and there's those things. And then I would say, I think, you know, ugly vegetables are vegetables too, right? I think you know? I, yeah, I think like you think of the lettuce, the cost of the lettuce and for the cost of the lettuce, you could get a head of cabbage 
Mm-hmm. And the, the cabbage, you're getting way more food. You think of the weight of a cabbage, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I would I would lay money on the fact that cabbage is better for you than lettuce. Um, there's probably more in it, right? There's more in there, more going on. But people don't buy it because what, you know, cabbage, there is a cabbage salad. It's called coleslaw. Um, yes. But uh, just the idea of cabbage is this unbelievably unsexy vegetable. <laughs> but you can, make, you can make delicious food out of cabbage. I know because I do it. No, um, cabbage rolls, you know, so delicious. Cabbage rolls are good, but just using it, I actually, you know, I have a way of uh, fermenting it. And then you, you add it to stir fries as one of the vegetables that goes in the stir fry. And so it becomes uh, tart and acidic and salty. And, you know, it, and by, by, by fermenting it, it lasts a long time, right? You put it in a jar and you put it in your fridge and it's it's good for months, right? Like kimchi, just, right? Kimchi. kimchi. Yeah. Very similar principle. Very similar. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in, in all the ways that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think those things would go a long way. I think, you know, we're very tired. I, you know, I, I'm tired too. We're all tired. <laughs> you know, we've, we've got burnout on a record record scale yes. for people who've been you know at first work from home seems like a godsend to people because you know we get our commutes back and we can start our hobbies but it also is a bit of a trap because then you you know there's no separation in your life you're always working or you're oh. always at home right so and then that creates this kind of psychological you know if impact on people where they're just tired all the time and so I you know what I agree when the first when the lockdown first happened and even after the lockdown where we we had the option to just work from home more um and we were working and even when the lockdown was lifted but we were still just working from home all the time uh you know my YouTube channel really took off like Mm -hmm. the views went up everything because everybody's trying to garden trying to figure out how to do it and they're like, hey, here's a guy that lives in a place that's cold like me, you know, so things really took off. I should have been putting out ridiculous amounts of content with my YouTube channel to take advantage of that. But I was, I wouldn't say I was clinically depressed, but I was really in this sort of funk uh, where I didn't feel like doing anything. I really, I was just like, and I think part of it was that when I'm at home, this is my play place. Even right here, my office. I'm in. I have a dedicated office. It's also a guest room. There's a bed over there. But this is the office, right? And this is where I where, merit, where all the magic happens, right? Maritime gardening. But I mean, during all of that period, I was doing my day job in here as well. So when I was done doing my day job, I didn't want to be in here. I didn't want to be editing videos, right? I didn't want to be thinking about anything other than being somewhere else because it, it it changed it changed the nature of this space right and for some people they don't have a, an office but like you know they were working in their kitchen on the kitchen table That's and so right. your your house became this place you do the stuff you don't want to do all day um you know so it, it really did it had like a, a depressing i mean i was with my family all day who i like <laughs> and you know like it wasn't that it, it was more like that was the other thing when I was like, my kids would be upstairs and I could hear them having a good time. And I was down here, you know, doing not whatever they were doing with them. Right. Um, so I, I found it really, so I, I agree with you. It was this weird sort of uh, period of time where you're, you're all you want to do is be home. Cause you know, you don't want to be at work and now you're home all the time and you can't stand it. <laughs> That's right. And you can't, you're not leaving work, right. Cause work is home and home is work. Right. And so I think, it, it did. I'm not a psychologist, right? But oh. there, there are lots of studies out there. People, you know, academics love to study new phenomenon. And COVID-19 is was, you know, a boon for a lot of research. Oh. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, but I think in terms of, you know, I think you bring up an important point. If you're working in your kitchen at the kitchen table, are you really going to want to, okay, well, I'm just on the laptop or my computer that has taken over my dining room table. And now I'm going to stand at the counter and the stove in the same room. And, and I, I think there's a bit of a barrier for people who to do that, you know, and I, I feel, I feel it myself and I, I feel it for other people. And, you know, you see it in the summer, like record number of people at the airport and, 
airports can't handle the number of people going, you know, because everybody was like, get me out of here. Like, get me out of here. Myself yeah, yeah. included. I couldn't wait. Didn't care. <laughs> I'd wait in the line for five hours if it meant I could get on an airplane. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> and so, you know, so in terms of, you know, saving money on food, maybe people don't want to hear, you know, stay home and cook, but maybe, you know, dedicate an afternoon to it and do it for the week and save yeah. it in Tupperware and then or freeze it and, and pitch it in the oven. And then you yeah. don't have to think about it. It's already done and yes. you're not spending extra time there. Right. I think yeah. when it, we don't have a plan and we don't you know what know what we want or what do you do you have any supper ideas or what do you want for supper oh, i don't know you know yeah 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 you spend more money and you know you waste more time right and you tend to waste the food in the fridge that you you know well I, you bought pieces of a meal but you didn't buy a whole meal so you know you have random ingredients that are just going to go bad right? well that so, speaks to i mean like one thing that uh, really irritates me about a lot of cooking shows that are popular on television today is they don't teach anything about cooking. Like they're really, I, I'm not talking about cooking. I mean, when I was a kid, cooking shows was a guy actually showing you how to cook. Walk with um, Yan. Walk with Yan or Julia Child or Jacques Pepin or whoever it is, right? They're, they were actually saying, here's, you know, do all this. I think my favorite one to watch on YouTube and the guy's still alive. He's like a hundred is Jacques Pepin. He'll show you how to, this is the proper way to peel a carrot. Like to that level of detail, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you listen to him, you'll actually do everything a lot faster, right? All Because he was a chef in a restaurant, right? And that's how he made a living for years as a prep cook all the way up from the bottom, right? Um, but now when you watch cooking shows on TV, it's it's more drama, right? You've got, you've got 12 people and each of them has a giant salmon and they they have to like there's 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 they're, they've never seen a salmon before and they're all supposed to fillet it and cook it um and they all butcher the thing and then uh you know someone tastes it and say this is garbage and throws it in the trash and he's like ah that was a beautiful salmon you just threw away right so i mean or you have a show where everybody's just making cake every week oh. and it, it's almost like marie antoinette you know, sort of thing like oh my god you're just making cake Right. But you're, even when you watch the cake show, you don't learn anything about how to make a cake. You can watch an entire season of one of these dessert shows and not know how to make a pie or a cake, not know a thing about how to make a pie or a cake. So people aren't learning how to cook. And it's been lost between generations because we've got, you know, dual income earner families. I'm not saying that's a, it's a necessity. Every, everybody has to work to just pay the bills right now. Right. Um, so, you know, at, at some point in time, you know, there was a, a continuity from from child to child to child on uh, all these basic skills. And now it's just been lost. And I mean, the resources are out there online to learn how to learn knife skills, learn how to cook things, learn how to cook from scratch, learn how to prepare, you know, learn how to prepare, learn how to cook rice, learn how to take dried beans and make a meal out of that, right? Which no one has had to do anymore. All those sorts of things, right? The resources are all out there on the internet, but that's not what is being done on the cooking shows, no. right? Someone's trying to like sear a scallop and if they make the slightest mistake, they all go in the trash. Um, so something, with me, it, it drives me crazy. I don't watch cooking shows because right. I feel like, uh, you know, cooking is sensory and, you know, it's not just visual. It's you have to smell it and taste smell it. it. Yeah, and I don't want to watch other people tasting quail eggs <laughs> or like all of these strange exotic ingredients or elevating things. I don't need to elevate it. You know, I was watching a sitcom and, and one of the characters was like, desserts don't need to be fancy. They just need to taste good. Yes. And food is like that, right? It does not need to be fancy. Spaghetti you can just boil some noodles and use some like sauce from a, a from a jar and saute up some mushrooms. Delicious. And just not jazz the sauce that. up a little bit. Yeah, like you add a couple things to the sauce and, and perk it up a little bit. And, yeah, delicious. Yeah. And, it, and it feeds a lot of people. And you'll never see that on a cooking show, right? No. Well, and another thing they never talk about, actually Jacques Pepin does talk about it, but most of them don't, is this concept of what's called fridge soup, right? Where every Saturday or Sunday or Friday, you know, some day of the week, you, you take everything out of the fridge that didn't get used and you doesn't necessarily have to be a soup, but all of that has to go 
in something. It's usually, it's usually soup is the rational choice, right? Where you right, just take that little bit of lettuce and you take the one carrot left is one carrot isn't enough for anything. And, you know, that sort of welted uh, celery, uh, the, the, the sort of heel of the celery that nobody wants, you know, all yeah. that crap can be thrown, you know, a little bit of leftover chicken, a little bit of this, you know, you can turn that all into a delicious soup, uh, you know, and then that's an entire meal made out of like comp, right, basically a, you know, you've got two pounds that, of something that was destined to be compost, and now you have that with uh, with some bread, and it's a delicious meal that everybody enjoys, right? The fridge soup thing. That's you know, that's yeah. that is something people can do because it's it's a way to all those, as you said, those those pieces of meals that aren't enough to be a meal. Finding clever ways to to turn those into meals. It doesn't have to be a soup. It can be. There's all kinds of different ways to use. You can make pat. It's amazing. When my kids were young, they loved spaghetti. Mm. And, you know, in their mind, what's in the spaghetti is hamburger and tomatoes and other stuff. And so as long as the other stuff wasn't distinguishable, <laughs> texture-wise, right, they would eat it. I could put anything in that spaghetti as long as it was small. <laughs> <laughs> and as long as it was red, right? As long as it stayed red and it was small. And some of those things, like uh, in the spring, I actually put dandelion greens in my spaghetti Aww. just from the yard. Um, before the flowers come up, they're they're they still taste like awful, right? But if you put them, <laughs> if you cook them into a spaghetti, they give it this wonderful sort of herby green sort of flavor. Not not too much, right? This, but you can you could pick like a bowl, almost like a salad bowl of of um, of uh, dandelion greens. And if you incorporate that into a regular spaghetti sauce, um, you know, enough spaghetti sauce for like, let's say two meals for a family of four, that's usually the, the quantity I make it in. Um, it actually adds a unique character to the meal. Mm. And as a weed, <laughs> some crap weed from your yard, right? Uh, that grows before everything else. Um, I'm gonna have to run soon. Yeah, I can, no, uh, yeah, I can hear my husband like, rattling close sorry <laughs> one more question and then we'll end it how about that mm. um so one thing a lot of people in my garden i grow a lot of things like potatoes and parsnips and carrots and things that are actually relatively cheap to buy in the grocery store right yes. or at least traditionally have been um so these things we refer to them as as cal uh, calorie crops and squash right right uh, as opposed to a lot of people grow pumpkins and then they make a jack-o-lantern and they throw it in the compost bin, right? Um, so it'd be wonderful if there was a pumpkin that could be a jack-o-lantern, but you could also eat. Yes. Uh, but for gardeners, I mean, not everybody has this kind of land, right? But for, I mean, there's so many people, I always think you've got a lawn, your lawn should be food, right? If yes. you have a lawn, you can make the lawn and the food. Uh, and if you can read, you can be a good, just like if you can read, you can be a cook. If you can read, you can be a gardener. You might have to fail a lot to achieve success that's right that's true that's um, true of life in in almost everything a lot so. of things in life yes unless you're like mm -hmm. a naturally athletic or whatever um mm -hmm. so you know for the person with lots of land land access do are, do calorie crops are they starting to make more sense than they used to does it make sense to grow your own potatoes and grow squash you know these things that take up a lot of space but actually when you pick it it stores for months with you don't have to refrigerate it you don't have to bottle it you, you know you just pick it you stick it on a counter somewhere and you eat it two months later and it's fine right i mean you can still buy those things and they're relatively low cost um but i think yeah so uh, yeah so i think actually instead of things that keep long i think you should grow what you're what you're skilled at growing right and so if that's well, how that? <laughs> peppers then then maybe you have more success with one certain type of plant than something that maybe would keep a little bit longer and I, what i love about gardening and i i study it but i don't do it myself is the sharing right and right. so you know you're not going to eat 45 jalapeno peppers but you're definitely going to bring them to work right and you're going <laughs> yes. to foster this conversation about food in a way that is that is not taking place otherwise because you're not buying jalapeno peppers at, at the grocery store and bringing them in to share them with coworkers. so right. i think in terms of would you save a little bit of money by by growing your own potatoes 
yes, you would. Obviously, if you're skilled at it, you're not paying for upfront for all the equipment. And so this is like, you know, after the investment is paid off for itself. And that's different for, you know, if you you add in the cost of the land and, and whatever tools you use and your time. I don't know financially if it if it makes sense. Um, but if, I think it does. In, but, yeah, so you do. But in terms of, as an anthropologist, in terms of community food security, I think it absolutely makes sense for us to, and even as an economist would tell you, you know, well, you, you know, you should focus on your, the thing that you're the best at and then trade other people for what they're best at, right? Yes, but yes. in terms of community food security, yes, grow those things that keep very long for you, but also grow things that you're especially skilled at and share those with people because right. I think that has, you know, consequences, positive consequences that, you know, doesn't just show up in pocketbooks. Do you know right. what I mean? I think yeah, yeah. we've reduced food to how much it costs financially when it's it should be the main thing in our lives and not not negatively right it should be a positive positive uh, you know situation or event or whatever not just not just an afterthought or not entertainment right so i think yeah. we have room for that so yeah absolutely you know grow your potatoes if you've got the land but if you only have a balcony and you are especially skilled at growing tomatoes by all means, grow those and bring them to your friends and family because that will pay you dividends, you know, that might not be financial, but right. you know what I mean? Yes, no, that makes sense. And yeah, yeah certainly if, if something <laughs> seems to be, or also for some people or for some locations, things just don't grow well because uh, right. you don't have the sunlight or the heat or that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's right. Definitely, uh, definitely part of it. All right, Janet. Well, boy, it's been great having you on the show. And this conversation went all over the place, but that's that's a good podcast, in my opinion. Uh, so <laughs> it's great having you on, and we hope we can have you back again. Maybe we'll have you back after the next report comes out, and we can talk about that. That'd be great. Yeah. So the report comes out December seventh. So um, I will add you. I should write this down. I always say I'm going to remember something, and I never remember. But I uh, send you an advanced copy. It'll be embargoed, so you can't really talk about it. But you can right. kind of see for yourself what's what the prediction is for the next year. Okay. Yeah. All right, yeah. That'd be great. Well, maybe we can do uh, like a January thing or a, a February thing, sort of. Normally, uh, December we do a season wrap up type. Thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, or we, could well, yeah my... we could do a special edition. I suppose we could do that. You know, no problem yeah. with that. Um, but yeah, it's been great having you on the show. Um, we hope to have you on you again and. Uh, Everybody out there, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, please like, share, subscribe. Oh, wait a minute. Janet, how do people get this report? Where do they go to find this thing? Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> the report and all of our research is located on our website, which is um, dal, D-A-L dot C-A slash A-A-L. So it's the acronym for the Agri-Food Analytics Lab. So okay. And, and you just go into the research tab and everything is there. So you, you know, and we, we do a lot of research and we make sure that it's accessible to everyone and, and, and easy to understand. Cause I know sometimes, you know, research can be a bit bloviating or, I know you know, that the, when I read, read the report, the, the method you use to do the estimates is incredibly sophisticated, but the report is very readable and very accessible. You don't need to be, um, you know, you don't need to be a PhD candidate to read it for sure. That's um, right. So, yeah. And also uh, I will put links to the report and your website on, if you're listening to this on YouTube, it'll be in the, in the um, description box. And if you're downloading this from my website as a podcast, It'll be in the show notes, you know, as always, when I have a guest, if they have stuff you might want to look up, I always have it provided there. So great. Uh, as I said before, everybody, if you'd like to, if you like this, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, and until next time, get out there, get at it, have fun in your garden. Thanks a lot, Janet. All right. Talk soon. <laughs> great. Bye. Hey, folks, want to help support everything I'm doing here? Check out my sponsors, Bessie's Seeds and Safer's Gardening Products. For Bessie's, go to their website, Bessie's.com. Use my coupon code GAVS22 and you'll get free shipping as long as there's a pack of seeds in your order 
and there's no oversized items in your order. Check out the description box of this video for details. Uh, for Safer's products, Woodstream products, you can buy all the things I use in my garden, Slug and Snail Killer, BTK, Endall. You can buy that from Vessies, or you can go to their websites uh, for a much wider range of products to solve just about any kind of problem that you can imagine uh, with high quality natural ingredients like oils from seeds and flowers and stuff like that. Uh, for, if, you, if you're in Canada, go to woodstreambrands.ca and as long as your order is over $69, you get free shipping. If you're in the United States of America, then go to saferbrand.com and as long as your order is over $45 US, you'll get free shipping from them. So yeah, if you want to help support the channel and the podcast and they sell something you need, buy from them and that'll help support everything I'm doing here. Thanks a lot.